So welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Mosni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Most of the time, Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I are the hosts for the webinar in this series, but today Mark Miller from Lawrence Livermore kindly agreed to play that role. So Mark, please take over. I'll stop my sharing. Okay, thanks, Osni. And I will start sharing. I'm also uh, pasting a link in the chat for the same things that I'm sharing here. Okay, it's my pleasure to moderate a conversation with Jean Schuler, a woman who has worked for more than 55 years in high performance computing and is finishing her 50th year here at Livermore Labs. I'm a huge history buff, and every time I have a chance to chat with Jean, I could sit with her for hours and talk about her experiences, especially in the early years at Livermore Labs. Uh, but today's conversation is not about uh, for me to ask questions. I can ask questions anytime I uh, sit with Jean. It's for all of you. Uh, so we've prepared a set of slides, which we plan to loop during today's conversation. The slides are primarily to provoke questions and include a notional chronometer up in the upper right corner there for every five year period from 1961. Dates are approximate, but uh, because the slide share takes away space from the speaker video, it may become distracting. And if so, we can turn that off. I've also posted a link to the slides in the chat if it's helpful. You can submit questions via chat or Google Doc. Uh, and Osni, I'll need your help on the uh, questions that come in through the Google Doc. Um, or you can use uh, Zoom's raise hand feature and we will call on you to unmute and ask your question. Call in only participants will need to wait until maybe the last 10 to 15 minutes of the conversation today to ask a question. Uh, I know that some of you attending may wish to make a few remarks or share a thing or two about your work with Gene, and, uh, and if you do, please use the Zoom raise hand feature for that, um, but also be mindful of time and allowing others to participate by keeping your questions or remarks brief, like maybe a minute. Um, so I'll start with a few questions, but my hope is I'm going to see some ra uh, raised hands rather quickly from others who wish to make remarks or ask questions or comments in the chat. In fact, I, and before I go further, I need to make sure that I'm actually seeing my chat. Okay, uh, there we go. And Osni did post the link for the Google Doc in the chat as well, so you can go there to ask questions as well. Uh, so, um, so as the slides go by, I, I know we've already gone through a few of them, but Jean, you uh, graduated from William & Mary in, I think, 63 with a, a major in mathematics. And I guess my first question to you is, what, uh, what prompted you to study mathematics? Uh, I was, just loved it in grade school, high school. I liked to do puzzles and things like that, and I was pretty good at it, so um, I... It was just something I like to do. I mean, just playing around with the with the uh, mathematical models and things like that, and getting into computing was fun. So. Now, when you uh, when you majored in math at William and Mary, you mentioned computing. There were there were there anything remotely looking like a computer science or programming class available to you then? No, there was the year I graduated in '63. They had a seminar about how to program in Fortran, but you didn't have any hands-on or anything. It was just a uh, a speaker getting up talking about programming language. So that's, I think that's why they um, hired me at NASA. I had a I had a 30-minute interview with NASA uh, in you know March or April, and I came to NASA in 19 June. Of 1963, not knowing what I was getting, getting myself into. So. Wow. And, and at, in your coursework, um, were you, how, many, how many other women were taking mathematics with you? Was it, was it quite popular among women then? No. <laughs> I think there were maybe three or four of us in the whole, in all of the mathematics uh, classes. We did, you know, tensor analysis and you know, different partial differential equations. And actually, my when I started at NASA, they gave me, they didn't know what to do with me. So they gave me some partial differential equations to solve while they were trying to figure out if I could do programming. <laughs> and, uh, and did you have to basically then solve those uh, manually? Yes. Uh -huh. Right. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. I mean, um, 
the many people have seen the movie Hidden Figures, probably aware of of NASA's use of women for computing, but. But, uh, but the word computer for many, many years in human history, in fact, most of human history, I'm sorry, not computing, but the word computer actually did not refer to a machine, but it referred to a person, usually a woman doing uh, manual calculations. And, and Jean is one of many women who, who was basically hired as a human computer for, for NASA. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so that makes me ask, I, I have all sorts of questions I'd love to ask about that. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, do, you, do you have a recollection of like, did you have to invert really big matrices, you know, like 10 by 10 matrices and stuff by hand? At, at first, that's how you did it by hand. And mm -hmm. then you got, then figuring out, I mean, there were some, um, some other ways during the, uh, <laughs> Uh, when I was learning Fortran, there were some libraries that you could use that did matrix inversion. But by hand was, you know, it was very tedious. You learned how to do that in the mat in uh, college, though. So, yeah, I was called a computer when I worked during during my years at um, while I was uh, in school. I worked at a company, and I was called a computer there. But I just used a calculator and did some failure analysis on submarines. So. <laughs> That and then draw do uh, curves for that. But I was called a computer at NASA, and the women who were in the um, the hidden figures were there when I was there. But I didn't even know about them until I saw the movie. So they were kept wow. isolated from us. But we all took our punch cards to the same computer center. Wow. Well, so now. You, you hired as a, a human computer, but it sounds like maybe during your time there, you did start doing some amount of programming. Yes, almost right away. I, I had taken that lecture on, on Fortran. And so I worked with some, you know, like Felix Pitts and Lou Reddish and some of these, uh, some of those guys who gave me computing, you know, they needed to have computer programs written for some of their, uh, applications satellite it was the, called the flight instrumentation division so I, they had cameras on some of the uh, satellites so, yeah. so and how long how long were you at langley i was there five years until my husband got a job at livermore lab and then they would not hire me in 1968 because they weren't hiring spouses which was to me a ridiculous rule because people met and got married there and they didn't kick one of them out so uh, in 1972, they changed that rule, and a whole bunch of women who had put their husbands through graduate school got hired there. <laughs> so, it's, it's an interesting. Thing to live more in our, uh, to live more area, I guess, in '68, uh, I wanted to work at the lab, but uh, but because of their rules, you weren't able to. So, so you worked at a place called MB Associates, correct? <laughs> That's where I met your father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's an interesting bit of uh, connection we have as you worked with my father. So, um, what uh, were you doing? Computing activities for MBA as well? Yes, they designed um, chaff for rockets, and so I wrote a program for dispersion of chaff to you know block incoming uh, signals. But we had to use punched cards. Um, so we didn't have a big computer at MBA. So I would drive the cards down to a place in Sunnyvale and run them through their 1620s <laughs> and get the output and take it back to the scientists. So wow, wow. So you that you basically that sounds a little bit like footnet at some level is you you had to take these decks of cards down to Sunnyvale and and run them there. Right. Now is that is that because that was the closest computing uh, facility available? Yeah, you could buy time there on a 1620. So okay, all that, right. That's, they were standing in line for people from other companies who were running their card decks through the 1620 machine. Oh wow, that would have been uh, interesting to have a photo of a bunch of different companies uh, lined right. up to run their decks through. Right. How long did a typical computer run uh, take uh, for for that? For the, for example, maybe the chaff simulation or something. Um, it didn't take that long because they were fairly simple codes, but I'd sit there for a couple hours and wait for my output and then drive it back. So back and then was there, the... wasn't, there, there wasn't much traffic back then. So okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite slow having to do that today. I imagine go, yeah. driving down five, 580 or whatever, going over uh, um, the grade to get into the uh, Bay Area. 
Um, now, was the output just printout or was it more, more, okay, it was printout. Right. All right. Now, did you, uh, did you ever have the misfortune of walking somewhere with a deck of cards, uh, Fortran <laughs> cards and, and, and dropping them? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. that's why they were numbered. So you can put them back through a sequencer and get them back in the right, <laughs> in the right order. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I recall my father mentioning that happening to him on multiple occasions. Um, so you were at MBA for, for uh, it sounds like 68 to maybe 70, I guess 72 is when you hired at Livermore right. Labs. Right. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so what was the, what was the hiring and interview process uh, like? Was it, was it an all day affair or was it relatively short? Well, I had actually interviewed with, uh, in 1968 when they told me I couldn't get a job there. So when I interviewed in 1972, I'd had a bunch of experience. So it was maybe an hour interview. And then I went over to work for MFE, let's see, with the magnetic fusion area. Um, but I sat in the cooler and for several months getting my clearance before I was able, using old teletypes. We had these oh. old teletypes. So. so maybe you can share with the group what, what, what you mean by the cooler. Oh, the cooler was in building 415 and it's where all new hires got sort of stuck. So there were people, engineers and physicists and chemists and you know all, all kinds of people that you met, which was really great because it was a good bonding experience for people who, you know, you'd see them at the lab for the next 20 years and you'd been in this in this unair conditioned huge room with teletypes um, all during the summer, you know, six months during the summer when it was ghastly hot. So uh Ugh. But it was it was good to meet all these people that were friends for forever, really, and good you know good contacts, different areas. I don't think they do that anymore. Yeah, I still I I still do hear the uh, the, the well I still think we call that building that the that new hires wind up sitting in for a while while they're waiting for the clearance the cooler. I, it certainly was when uh, when I when I got there as well. Now I'm looking for any hand raises. Uh, Osney, am I uh, am I perhaps missing any questions in the Google Doc or hand raises? I see. I think I, oh, Bar I, I think Barbara's trying to get our attention here, but it looks like uh, Barbara it looks like you're having trouble with your audio, and I really apologize. Mark, for Go ahead, Mark, Osney. There yeah. is one question uh, in the in the Google Doc, but it's more related to running. Oh, <laughs> well, that's uh, that's perfectly fine. We had a, a picture. I, not, so you got into running, I guess, with the LRL road, road runners uh, shortly after you got to Livermore Labs, I guess. Correct. Well, actually, it was a big competition. Um, there were some guys I worked with that were very competitive and they wanted to um, to race against B Division who had runners. So they needed a woman. <laughs> so they talked <laughs> me into running a mile. <laughs> And that was the start of the run for home and my running career at the lab. So, wow. Wow. So, Osney, go ahead. What, please, please uh, uh, ask the question about running. OK. How many thousand miles have passed beneath your feet over 55 years of lunchtime runs? Oh, my gosh. Well, we would run. I, I don't know if I can calculate it. I started running probably in the late 70s and we would run at least five to once a week we'd run the eight eight mile loop and then the other days we'd run four or five so that wow. was but it was good bonding and it was you know we talked about work and complained about different things but it was uh it was very challenging and, and fun to meet different people on the road and it was a big running craze back then so well and you you, you still uh, go out and run uh, pretty regularly right now don't you oh yeah yeah it's uh I don't call it running anymore. It's more jogging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm lucky if I can get in a, a full mile gene before my legs or feet are telling me I need to need to stop. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that, to be quite honest. Well, you're you're the cyclist. So you you guys, the cyclotrons pass us on there on the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's another another major, major fitness group at the lab on bikes. So, um, OK, now I'm not seeing any hand hand raises, but I you know, I. I may I may pick on on Ned because only because I see Ned in the, among the video uh, here and I had a chat with him. Or, oh, and, and there's a question that come, came in as well. But nonetheless, Ned, I, I know that you had mentioned to me earlier you did want an opportunity to make a remark or two. Is it would now be an appropriate time? 
Sure, I, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, so I, I, first, I'll just start by thanking Eugene um, for agreeing to do this. It's it's a wonderful gift that that you're giving us um, to share, you know, everything you've learned over your career. And and I know you're not a person who who seeks the spotlight. So thank you for for doing this. Um, it's it's more for all of us than it is for you. And um, and it's you know wonderful to see all these pictures and and hear these stories. So, you know, I've, I've been working with you in LC in, in more recent times. Um, you know, I've, I've been at the lab for about 20 years and I think I've known you in some capacity or other over most of that time. And, you know, currently you're, you're serving as a workforce manager and, and a technical consultant in our hot, hotline. And, you know, what I really appreciate about what you do is, you know, you make this a better place to work in, in so many ways and for so many people. Um, particularly, you know, in your involvement with our students and our e early career employees through the HPC Cluster Engineering Academy and, you know, building that sense of community, um, you know, you, you just have an amazing and tremendous ability to, to connect with people, to build networks and connect with people on, on a human level and, uh, and just, you know, improve our, our working lives and, and you one way you do that, and, and you share this with me, right, is that you uh, listen when people call you in the hotline, you, you keep a keen ear open for, for what kind of work they're doing on our systems. And you think about, you know, is this something that our people in LC would like to hear about to share the science and, and the impact that, that our work is having? You know, so often in LC, we, um, you know, we're focused on keeping the machines running and, and you know, keeping the queues full and, and so on. So it's, you know, you make that extra effort to bring the science back to us, to bring speakers back to, to share their work with us. So thank you for that. Um, so I'll just, you know, for the sake of time, I'll end with a question, which is pretty open-ended, but, you know, what advice do you have for us to, who will be kind of carrying on your legacy, you know, developing the workforce, working with early career employees and students, you know, what are, what are the big challenges you see that are ahead for us and, and how can we, uh, for lack of better words, not screw it up? <laughs> well, I, I think making the, the new employees comfortable and, and just having them um, be available to, to answer any kinds of questions for them, find mentors for them. To me, that's one of the most important things is when you get new employees to, to always be, be helpful and no question is stupid. So it's, um, it's really, it, it's just making, finding a way to connect with them in whatever capacity and make them comfortable. So, you know, young people are our futures. And so it's, it's great to have them there. So um, uh, thank you, Ned, uh, for, for those remarks and questions. And I have some, I see some more coming in, Jean. So I'm just going to recite some of those that I see. And, and uh, Osni, as, as you need to from the Google Doc as well, please uh, interrupt. Um, but so here's one from uh, Philippe Blaine. Over the course of your career, what was the most transformative technology you worked with? Oh, my gosh. Um... Well, I think going from the 66 and 70, CDC 66 and 7600s from the 60-bit words into the 64-bit words was, was, that was really, uh, that was really a challenge. And then having the MAKO, we had the MAKO there too. And then, so it seems like Livermore gets one of a kind to test the new um, quantum computers now, or is a fabulous uh, uh, experiment to see how that's going to go. And we have a good group that's doing that, but it's, it's just changes. Every time we get a new machine, there's something different, new programming models, uh, new hardware. Um, GPUs has been fabulous to, to get GPUs out there too. Um, for, people who, for people who may not uh, be uh, completely aware what those are, GPU general uh, graphics processing units, which were originally created to do a lot of graphics, such as you may see on the screen now, but have also been able to do some amazing floating point calculations at, at super high speeds. Okay, thanks. Another question, uh, Jean. Uh, let's see, this is from David Smith. When I was at NASA Ames, our Cray YMP had wiring issues and actually burned some wires. Did your YMP at the lab have issues too? 
I'm not sure. I maybe we have some hardware people on here that might know that. I don't. I actually vaguely remember something about that. Um, does anybody else have any information on that? But I do know we had some YMP issues, so that might have been what they were. What uh, now that we're talking about some of these machines, uh, Gene? Um, so you worked initially with the CDC 6600 and 7600, and that was for the magnetic fusion uh, uh, energy program, which uh, which is sort of the was the seeds of what eventually became NERSC, correct? Right. Right. Do you have? Well, I'm just curious out of that era if you have a favorite favorite machine. Um, I think ASCII Blue, one of the Blue Pacific machines um, that we had, and ASCII White, they were they were fabulous machines that people from the tri labs used, and we we uh, wrote a lot of documentation, and it was really the forefront of some of the big uh, computational challenges that we. Uh, that we had. So I, I think those were my favorite machines. Uh, got a lot of use out of them and got a lot of good performance and number one on the, you know, top 500 list for a while too. So. How about, uh, so I'll just, I see some other questions in, uh, in chat here. And, and by the way, um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, for advice from either Rosny or maybe Lois, whether or not the slides are, are more of a distraction or I should keep looping them. I think you can continue. Well, I'm enjoying them. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> yes. All right. We'll keep we'll keep looping them. Thanks. Uh, moving on. Um, uh, before I get William uh, Langham has a question here. What was your most memorable moments in your career? Um I actually I think when Nurse went to Berkeley in 1996 and was a really <laughs> memorable it was pretty devastating to have the computer center be be moved and all of us at Nurse were trying to find either decide whether to go up to Berkeley or stay at the lab and at that time um, we all had to apply for jobs over at, at Livermore which I think was best for Livermore because a lot of people didn't want to go to Berkeley. Um, so I built a customer service group over at Livermore. So I think that might have been my uh, one of my most memorable moments was moving to uh, moving from when nurse left and moving to, to Livermore and and meeting all of the great people over there. It was the start of a new career really for me. Wow. Okay. Thanks for that question. I see I, so, someone has their hand raised. Bar, Barbara, you, I see you have your hand raised. Do you, are, do you think you have an audio working now? Uh, can you hear us? Yes, we hear you, Barbara. Okay. Here's Felix. Yeah. Hi, Jeannie. And by the way, Je Jeannie, Jeannie is what we called her back at NASA in the old days. It's good to see you again, Jeannie. Hi, hi. Nice to see you. It's great. We, we, had a, we had a great time back there. I, they stuck me in with the secretary because they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> I recall. Oh. And I, I'm Barbara, and I remember I first knew Jeannie. She used to come in our office, and um, I, I need to mute. Okay. There's some That's feedback a, in there. I've got a little <laughs> vibration there. <laughs> Anyway, Jeannie used to come in our office and speak to us when she came over to the computation center. <laughs> That's how I first knew her. <laughs> right, right. We, we had some good times there. It was sad for me to leave. That was really sad. I think I cried from Virginia all the way to California. <laughs> Well, Jeannie, this is Felix again. I, I, I do recall when you and Bill came to Barbara with my wedding in uh, 19, April of 1971. Oh, right. I remember that very well. Cool. Yeah. So I would try to help with the, uh, the, the uh, uh, echo problem, but I'm having difficulty isolating it. So my apologies. Yeah, the okay, same here. <laughs> desktop so we can see everything better. But we don't have a camera on the desktop. Okay. So we've got our individual cell phones. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to go down the list to see where that's coming from. And honestly, I just can't figure it out. So my apologies. Um, 
I did restart the slide roll again, and uh, um, and I'm sorry, Barbara and Felix, did you have did you have a question you wanted to ask Jean as well? No, I don't. Do. I don't think so. Okay. No, no well, technical questions of any import. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sure we sure appreciate you joining us uh, as well. Um, uh, so I'll move on through uh, some of the questions here. It looks like I got a comment. They like the slides, so that's good. In fact, I'm going to I now. So some of the pictures you see passing now are actually from the NASA Langley days. Um, and so I'm going to circle back uh, before I get to a, uh, a a couple of questions that have appeared here in chat. So when you came to Livermore, um, or even at Langley for that matter, did you did you end up having to sort of uh, conform to a dress code of of, of any sort? <laughs> Yeah, that's, we were not, I don't think it was actually written anywhere, but women were, had to wear dresses or skirts. And so I think finally somebody let us put, we had to wear, uh, what do you call them? Pantsuits. They let us wear pantsuits. And once you let us put on pants, you know, <laughs> we could wear whatever we wanted because the guys were walking around in shorts and everything else, but the women were supposed to wear wear uh, dresses and nylons and high heels. Same at same at NASA too, which was interesting, but. Wow, so well now that was gonna be my next question. Was the dress code only for the women? It sounds like it was. Yeah. Okay. And wow. uh, Mark, uh, Mark uh, Jean, Mark, there is a question here in the Google Doc that's related. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. What changes have you seen in the proportion? Well, actually it's not quite, but what changes have you seen in, in the proportion of women in HPC and the work environment for women? Um, well, actually, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really different at Livermore because we have a lot of women in HPC, but I'm not sure how that is in other places, but women are very much supported um, in our computing center and in our com uh, computing directorate at, at Livermore. I mean, they, we have some spectacular women. Um, I don't remember other than the women at NASA, which were in you know the computing from hidden figures. I don't remember a whole lot there, but I think the numbers are actually going down now about women in computing in other places. But at Livermore, I think they're very much supported. Another no. one then. Oh, go ahead, Asni. Okay, so what is one advice you would give a female student who would want to venture into a career focused on HPC? Any regrets? Any anything you think you could have done differently? Well, I certainly don't have any regrets. I think one of the things that I mentioned earlier was the best best advice would be to. Um, <laughs> Well, maybe never marry a physicist, but other advice would be to, um, to find a really good mentor, you know, find someone who you can connect with and, and just, you know, be really open and not be afraid to ask any questions at all, but just really be, um, if, if you, and, and take opportunities wherever you can, even if it sounds like a stretch, if somebody offers you something that you think would be fun, but you're not sure you're capable, you know, go for it. It's it's fun to take risks and um, and do something different too. Work in different areas. And Mark, I see there are a couple of questions. Yeah. There's the chat if you can. Sure, I'll uh, I'm going to circle back to uh, William Langham's question, and then we'll continue through them. Um, Gene, how many people would you say have come to LLNL or perhaps another STEM area? because of your recruiting? Oh my gosh. Actually, I think a lot. I mean, I've done recruiting at Northern Arizona University. We've got some spectacular people from there. Sonoma, um, San Jose State, even William & Mary. I've gotten a bunch of people from William & Mary to come. Um, we've had, at NERSC, we had a super kids program where we had high school kids come for a couple of weeks and I actually had them staying at my house. And um, I taught a ray tracing, <laughs> taught ray tracing to them for, uh, you know, it was, it was a fun adventure. But we still have people at the lab, two people at the lab who went through our super kids program back in the 90s. Um, through expanding your horizons, the girls conference, I think, and, and our HPC Academy that we've been running for the last, I've, I've been involved for three years. We've gotten some excellent, outstanding 
students there. And I think it's just, you know, making it a, you know, a well, warm, welcoming environment and showing that there's a lot of, a lot of things that uh, we've, yeah, I, I see Martin saying he's here because of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah, that's great. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Martin. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, I'll, I'll continue on to another uh, question. Uh, so this is from, uh, I'll maybe mispronounce it, Nathisha Naka. Uh, what problems, obstacles do you see persisting for women and other marginalized groups in predominantly white male dominated STEM fields? Ooh, wow, that's a, that's, that, that's a focus question. Right, well, I think it's just, it's been the same for forever, you know, it's, as women sent, tend not to be heard they have to learn to speak up and not be um not be thought of as being you know kind of obnoxious um it's it's difficult to be in a meeting with all men and and try to get your voice heard um it's i don't know it's just a a, a gender thing where we just have to speak up for ourselves and make sure that that uh people know what we're saying now, early on, Jean, did you perhaps find that uh, somewhat challenging in your in your first few few years, either either within uh, just either language? Well, I'll, I'll focus on Livermore specifically, just because right. that's where I have an affinity. Uh, was that finding your voice to be able to do that? Was that maybe difficult? And if so, what? How did how did you manage to overcome that? Well, I think a lot of women, because we would get together, a lot of women, and we all had the same. You know, nobody listens to us, but. It, it tends to be just that um, you need to be more more forceful and and if somebody take if you say something and then nobody hears and then a, a guy will say the same thing you have to say yeah that was my idea too just to make sure that people understood that that you uh, had the same ideas but it, it was always you know I, I don't think it's as much a problem now but it was it was for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so just because we had a couple of slides go by with some of those early, and I'm going to put an air quote here, printer tests uh, that people would run on the, the machines uh, er, early on, it was the, the culture was okay to uh, basically have some pretty risque, racy, fo uh, fo either photos or, uh, or printouts uh, posted up in people's offices. Oh, yeah, that was the standard printer test was pinouts, pinups. Um, so every time we get a new printer, they'd run this special, you know, program through, and then the, they would put these pinups on the walls to show that the printers would work. Um, and then when I first came to, well, to uh, Livermore, they did have a, a in our news line, they had weekly pinups of, of women at the lab swimming pool because we had an Olympic-sized swimming pool because the lab used to be a a Navy, a Navy base where they train Navy SEALs. And so they would take pictures and put them in the lab newspaper. And I think I sent you, I think I saw one through, it said, uh, the Nevada test site has pretty girls too, you know, a pin up sitting next to a swimming pool. But they stopped that not to, I think, I think the men complained and the men wanted pinups of them <laughs> too. So they, they stopped putting that in the, in the news line. But it would, and nobody really thought anything of it at the time. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, I, yeah, pretty normal. I see Carol has her her hand raised. So, uh, so Carol, if you can unmute and ask your question or, or make a remark, please feel free. Hi, Jean. Carol Hunter Coleman. Oh my gosh, Carol! Wanted to say hello. <laughs> Jean, Jean's husband and my husband at the time joined the lab at the same time. Right. And in 72, at a party, Jean said to me, hey, you know, the wives issue is gone now. And so she and I hired on about the same time. Right. That's you know. And uh, my husband, Sam, and I retired in 99 and we're happily living in the mountains around Reno. Wow. Wow. So that's yeah there was another one mary singleton was another one who yes. hired on at the same yeah. time that carol and i did and yeah big influx i said yay yeah. right wives can now get a job at the lab right and, and carol like jean, was, jean i had a math math degree and was just learning how to how to do programming right 
And so. Carol, Carol and Barbara Atkinson were high level women in Livermore Computing when I when nurse left and I was, went over there. So, yeah. so well, I think in answer to one of the questions, what do women need to do? They need to be sure of their information and then say what they have to say. And if it isn't heard, say it again. Yeah, good, yeah. great. Uh, nice. Okay, nice Thanks. seeing you. Yeah. Uh, well, wow. thank, thanks for sharing that, Carol. And, and I, you know, I can't recall, but I, I went to a SIGGRAPH in Dallas. The first SIGGRAPH I went to was in Dallas. And I think that was maybe the first time I met Carol, at that time, Carol Hunter. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, thanks thanks so much for, uh, for your remarks, Carol. Thank you. Uh, um, and uh, let's see. So, Osni, I just want to ask, any questions come through in the Google Doc at all? Uh, that was all. Yeah, no, I think we have another one in the chat. Okay, boy, I've seen a lot of a lot of great comments have gone by in the chat. Uh, um, uh, so Becky's uh, saying, "Yay, Jean, uh, and thanks for your work on the HPC Academy." Um, uh, let's see. Thanks for your answer and advice. Okay, that had to do with uh, Carol Carol's answer. Okay, so um, so continuing on then. So initially at Livermore Labs, uh, you you were I think you did some work in uh, storage, right? You were working on storage systems. In fact, there's a memo somewhere in these uh, slides from you from 1975, in which you were informing the user base at Livermore Lab that the pack rat system was full. Um, <laughs> can you, uh, can you and, and this is never a problem that the storage people have is that systems filling up, that, that, that never happens. So, right, <laughs> yeah, we know that's not true. So uh, can you briefly describe what pack rat was? Uh, pack rat, I wrote pack rat. It was a disc. We had big disks. And uh, so we would fill up the disks and then the, the data would get transferred to the tapes. So, um, so we would have to offload the disks uh, onto the tape. But when they would get backlogged, we'd have to uh, ask people to delete their files. And then I wrote a uh, tape repacking when we had the big nine track tapes, uh, tape repacking um, program too. So I'd go in the, in the middle of the night into building 117 and hang the tapes, erase some and repack them and write them on other tapes. So that was a, that was a venture in, in uh, hanging tapes in the middle of the night in the, on the, I think it was the 6,600 and the 7,600 tape systems. That was, that was fun. So. so you'll you'll be surprised to know when I when I saw the name of that piece of software is Packrat, I, I went and looked out to see if there's any software today named Packrat, and sure enough, there is. There's a website for something called Packrat. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a uh, it's a Python wheel, I think, uh, for for something. So some not sure it's, if it's related to storage. It may be related to compression somehow. Ah, okay, um, well, that's fun. <laughs> So, uh, so after you worked on storage for a little bit, I think you got into uh, to uh, some graphics, uh, supporting some uh, graphics. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, let's see. I wrote a program called Netplot. We had these old television monitor display systems. It was a kind of state of the art back then that it was that were in some people's offices, and so Netplot would actually take the data and then the code, and then we would display the information. It was usually two-dimensional data, you know, graphs and those things on the screens. Uh, we also had something called remote job entry terminals, RJETs sprinkled all over the lab. And it was, um, we had a, a system called the octopus system, which was really state-of-the-art back there, back then too, um, that, that connected all of the, the networks through all of the buildings. So, Livermore had a lot of really great technology back then. And I, I also was in, had um, all of the graphics libraries that we'd get new libraries from like the display system. And, and when we bring them back into the lab, we'd have to um, modify them to run on our systems, make sure that they ran and that they were, they were correct. And back then people didn't have passwords either. So you could walk into somebody's office and sit down at their terminal and see what they were working on. That changed, definitely changed. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, now I'm, I'm occasionally muting now because every Wednesday morning I've got a landscape crew that hits the house right next to mine and they can be quite <laughs> loud. So my apologies. A few more things have come through um, in the, uh, the chat here. Let's see. Um, 
How did you keep up with the fast growing technology? <laughs> I'm not sure as anybody can ever keep up with that, especially in customer service. You know, they're always bringing in new machines and, and test machines and new software and operating systems. So we, we really rely on all of our sysadmin and our, you know, our, our uh, software people to, um, to keep us informed of the real, the really latest technology, but it, we have, you know, training sessions and all kinds of um, opportunities to learn about it through, you know, learning online webinars or, or classes and, um, and the lab is really good at, let, at sending you to training too, any kinds of training that you need that's going to help you. So it was great being able to take classes and uh, and bringing in, I mean, what's one of the things I do is bring in, bring in trainers for Python and C++, that sort of thing. So, uh, so uh, Becky Springmeyer asked a question here. I'll expand it slightly. She said, asked, do you have a lot of SIGGRAPH memories? I'll say, do you have a lot of SIGGRAPH or perhaps Cray user group memories? Um, SIGGRAPH, yeah, I used to, I used to be heavily involved in SIGGRAPH and go down to the meetings down in, um, uh, uh, Sunnyvale um, and and Cray User Group. I went to a um, was honored to go to a, a Cray User Group meeting in Trondheim, Norway, and they didn't have a they had you know hardware and software, but they didn't have a customer service area where you did you know learned how to deal with customers and documentation and training. So I said, boy, you know. That'd be nice if they had that. And they said, well, then why don't you start it? <laughs> so I started a track for customer service for the Cray user group and, and worked my up to, uh, way up to be on kind of a vice president where I would set up some of the, the conferences in Kyoto and, um, and Berlin and uh, Barcelona. So I got to travel extensively through the Cray user group and meet people from all over the world because the crays were were sprinkled all over the world and and they were it was great to meet all of these people yeah oh yeah brett gorda said he went to kyoto and berlin too <laughs> <laughs> um now i seem to recall you having a story that a, a a particular city's marathon or maybe some major uh running race coincided with a cray users group meeting and and you managed to somehow go and, and do this amazing run. And next day, even though you were exhausted, you were managing a Cray user group meeting. Oh, right, right. That was, <laughs> I think that was, actually I ran marathons in London and Barcelona, but it, I, <laughs> wow. the, the, the one in, the one in, uh, I didn't actually want anybody to know I was going to run it, but, um, and that was the London one, but, um, but the Cray user group was right after that. And just trying to walk up the steps and go to the meetings was, it was pretty obvious I was uh, <laughs> having a hard time. But anyway, it was, it was great to be able to take those opportunities on travel to do fun things and stay a couple extra days, so. So I see uh, Jeff uh, Cleary made a remark. We still repack tapes today and use that same term. That's fascinating to me, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, some things see. never change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the th reasons I love history so much is often I I'll, I'll, will go back and look at the way things were done, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And like there were people struggling with the same problems, you know. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Brent said, I tried to ask in a spreadsheet, uh, but Osney hates me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I asked that question. <laughs> oh, Brent, come on. Oh, 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 okay. I, you know, it's weird that that question was asked. This is how many miles, Gene. I was, I, so I didn't know how many average miles you average because you used to run pretty regularly with Mike McCoy, I think, at lunchtime, right? Right. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking you you on the, uh, would go out and run three miles. For me, three miles at lunch would take the entire lunch hour. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I, I think I, I, I calculated if you did that two or three times a week for forty years, it was something like sixty thousand miles. So it's it's right. it's quite a, quite a distance. Well, one of the best things about the lab, and they do, don't really do this anymore, is is we used to compete. We had we had a roadrunners group, and we would compete with in industrial league races with HP and IBM all, all over the Bay Area. And we would host them at Livermore too, and run around the Sandia Loop. But we always won. We had, we had fabulous runners. And, and so that was a, 
and it was you know it was associate directors who were doing it and, and all kinds of people who who um who participated so that was a great way to meet people in um, various areas so it was great fun and so Osmi, I'm I'm not uh, I'm I, I'll again I'll I'll pester you for a minute. Any any new questions in the Google Doc? No new questions there. Okay. Um, okay. So so we've talked quite a bit about the uh, the distant past. You you uh, you worked uh, uh, initially in storage, then you started working on graphics, and then uh, uh, kind of your experience is kind of similar, to, I think, to mine. I, I support the visit project and. Often I learn what users are trying to do with the science they're trying to do because they're having a problem with looking at their data. And I think you had a similar experience in trying to help people look at their data with graphics and that got you into, into customer support. So what do you, so in, in that area, what, what do you, uh, what, so my, I guess, let me ask you this one because we deal with this all. How do you deal with a really, do you ever have any really difficult customers and, 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 and you know really challenging ones and, and how do you deal with that <laughs> well mostly they're just frustrated because they can't they can't get their work done and so you, you just really try to be helpful to them and figure out what it is that they're doing sometimes they're explaining something that isn't really what's happening so you have to calm them down and and really figure out what it is that they're asking and and i like customer service because after dealing with you know, not only just competing customer service, but, you know, Comcasts and PG&E and everything, and, and, and you get put on hold and people are rude to you. Um, so that's what I try to bring to customer service is, you know, really trying to help someone and not saying, you know, read the documentation or transferring them off to somebody else because you don't know the answer, but really trying to, to find out what their problem is and help them because that's what our business is anyway. And, um, and, and they really appreciate that. They, uh, and I've dealt with some really poor customer service areas, but, and just, we've had, well, I guess I won't go into detail about some of our angry customers. <laughs> well, learning, <laughs> learning, learning the skills to deal with that, I think is, uh, is probably uh, important, especially for many of us who have software that's sort of out there being used by by you know a number of users and and yeah it's it it's often the case that users will get be frustrated for one reason or another i'm curious what do you what do you think what role do you think for example documentation plays in the user experience well i think it's really important um i mean whenever anybody asks a question and i you know i don't just say read the documentation i try to walk through it with them but documentation is it's really really important and people tend not they'd rather call and ask a question and if you can you know explain it to them and then point out the documentation and then sometimes they will point out areas in the documentation that are misleading or you know obtuse or something very difficult to understand. So it's really helpful if you're lead, you know, explaining it to them and showing them documentation. So it's helpful for you and for them too, to, to get more clarification. But I documentation is really important. And videos, think, I like the videos to show you how to do things. Do you think that documentation is as, as, uh, as big a focus area now as it perhaps was uh, when you were first starting? Um, it, I think it was really important when we were first starting because there wasn't that much way to, not a good way to communicate. So they had to read the documentation. Um, and now that we have you know, service desks and people can call, we can point them to the documentation, but back in the, you know, in the, uh, where you didn't have all, you, you were mostly doing um, phone calls, but now we have screens that we can see what people are doing and that sort of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I think documentation will always be a key. So I see a, uh, a, a Be Becky is a quote, she, she recalls a quote from you, says, uh, Jean can diffuse uh, well, maybe not from you, but about you. Gene can diffuse a tense situation in about 30 seconds. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good skill. Right. Well, someone when someone comes in and is irate, you, you got to calm them down. So 
they just really want to get their work done. That's that's all. They're not mad at you. They they want to throw the computer out the window because they're not understanding what's going on. So just explain what's going on. So. So I see we're, we're down to about 10 minutes uh, left in the hour here, and I, I wasn't paying attention, Osni, and I'm not sure if you have been either. Did we have a, a very large number of people who have, quote, just called in, call in only participants? Um, what do you mean? I, at some point, there were, I think, 110, I think. No, I mean, uh, they ah. were only, only on the phone and did not have an opportunity oh. to raise hand or, or perhaps type in the chat. Let me... I, um, I, mm, I don't know, Mark. I'm I'm looking through the list right now. Just normally, I would just see telephone numbers. I think from the no, it looks like pretty much everybody's on. Oh no, no, yes, no okay. phone number. Yeah. Okay, um, okay, that's a good thing. So uh, again, like to uh, uh, <laughs> here's a okay. Here's a question that just came in. When did the Christmas parties start? <laughs> <laughs> so for let me just preface before you answer Jean. I, I had the privilege of attending a Christmas party at Jean's house maybe within the last uh, six or seven years. Really enjoyed it, but I was stunned by just how uh, large it was and how many people uh, Jean was able to host at a Christmas party in her home. Uh, so with that with that context, go ahead, Jean. Um, actually, I think I started you know maybe twenty years ago with a small group, and then. Um, and it just kept growing. And then I'd invite my, you know, my neighbors and it was an open house. And, and I didn't want people to bring things because typically it's with after work and the only thing people would bring would be chips and salsa. <laughs> so we had way too much chips and salsa. But um, yeah, I've had, um, I, I just invite, put flyers up and say open house. And the best thing is I want people to bring their families and their kids. And I have an upstairs area where a um, bunch of us, bunch of women play mahjong. So I turned that into a big Legos playroom for kids and put soft drinks. And the, so the kids and John Gyllenhaal has come before many years and done some magic tricks. Um, but it's great to meet, you know, people bring their little kids and, and they grow up. And I think, um, I think, I've had this, like Steve Ashby's son Hunter when he was four years old, and now he's grad graduated. And um, just seeing the kids grow up and the families being able to meet each other and bringing husbands and wives and spouses and kids is the fun part for me. So, um, so I see a, a question from Haya came in here. How do you get the next generation excited about a career in HPC and uh, the lab, uh, especially with the allure of industry uh, so nearby? Well, that's that's a difficult question when I go recruiting because if, if you explain the mission of the lab and what's important and, and the work-life balance, and you know, they they it, it depends if they want to go out and make a lot of money and work their you know, butts off in, you know, Google or LinkedIn or somewhere like that. That's one thing. But if they really want to have a purpose in life and and have opportunities to move around and not just get stuck writing, you know, code for something that, that you know, and, and be able to go to seminars and travel, that's that's the that's the, the thing that I push when I when I recruit is just opportunities and work life balance and you know, Livermore and, uh, it's a nice place to live. It's close to mountains and oceans and and uh, cultural events. So it's uh, and and like I said before, there's so many opportunities to move around the lab and and learn about the science that goes on. It's it's just fabulous, fabulous science. So you know, global you know climate modeling and human genome and and uh, the National Admission Facility, all of that stuff is uh, really exciting to work on. And meeting the scientists too. And you can't tell a scientist from a janitor around there. They all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and as it, throughout your career, computing has played a larger and larger role in, in so many uh, aspects of science now. Um, and uh, and so yeah, it's you can't you. It's really uh, I think a big challenge for a lot of areas of science to sort of do um, you know be productive in science without getting involved in computing and 
in some way. Right. So I'll read through a couple of other remarks real quick. Uh, Becky says, thanks for opening your home uh, to so many groups, um, students, families, uh, and, uh, and team members. Uh, let's see, um, Jesse Gaylord, yeah, Christmas parties, woohoo. Uh, let's see, um, and then Nolan, uh, soon, soon joy uh, to everyone, Nolan says hi. Um, oh, good, oh, good, nice. Um, so uh, one of the, th one, I'll, I guess we've got just a few minutes left, I'll, I'll and Nazni, are there any in the Google Doc? I just want to circle back to you in case I've uh, crossed over anything there. No, it's, uh, we okay. are good there. Um, do you have a recollection, uh, Gene, of may maybe uh, the, the most difficult or chal challenging bug that you ended, either you yourself encountered or you, you were helping a customer with that ultimately turned out to be a pretty gnarly bug? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, I don't r really have one. It's some, I think some of the operating system bugs were some of the hardest ones that to, to sign. I wasn't particularly involved in them, but a lot of the times the machines kept crashing and crashing and crashing. And it was mostly the sysadmin that were, you know, day and night up trying, trying to figure out, um, why the machines were crashing. Sometimes it was a, a vendor bug. But uh, the people that I work with have just really been amazing to the, the tenacity they have in finding, finding these bugs. It's just incredible people to work with. Well, it's a, little, it's a little like puzzle solving at the end of the day, you know, like what, what's, what, you know, what's going on and why getting to the root cause. Um, right. Um, so let, I'll ask uh, one one other quick question since I don't see uh, there's some other uh, other re remarks coming in. Oh, uh, Rashawn Knapp says this has been a real treat. Thank you, Gene uh, and Becky. Can you say something about the computer center facilities? Um, do you want to, Becky? Do you want to uh, uh, TSF? Becky, you want to unmute maybe and clarify? Yeah, I don't it's a great place to work. I mean, it's a fabulous building. It's four stories. It's got um, fabulous. I mean, the, the 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 cooling and the heating. And I don't know if Becky might want to say something about that. I, well, I, Jean, I, how did you feel? How did you feel being there in four fifty one and watching watching that uh, building rise out of nowhere? Must have been pretty remarkable. Oh my gosh! It was yeah. When they were building that uh, the four eighty three, the four story with huge, huge um, computer room floors. It was just amazing. And all of the downstairs facilities with the, the cooling and, and uh, watching them, you know, with the, un the where they were putting the, uh, the wiring and the cooling underneath the, the big main machine floors. That was just, that was fabulous. The technology that went into that was amazing. Yeah. A lot of history there from MFECC all the way to Terrascale Simulation Facility, which yeah. we should not have named that. But right. anyway, <laughs> just now it's <laughs> <scale and> beyond. <laughs> yes. Well, so Gene, the I guess slides last... are great, Mark. Oh, oh, super! Um, glad, glad people uh, found that, like those. Um, I had a lot of fun searching around, especially for some of the, some of the stuff that I saw, uh, you know, from Gene early on in the seventies. Uh, but real quick, Gene, um, would would you say overall you were able to have a lot of fun in, in your career in HPC, and 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 if so, what do you think made made it the most fun? Oh no, it was it it it's it's the best place I've you know it's just amazing. The people are so nice and so helpful, and and we have morning meetings every morning, and people joke around, and we have uh, if somebody makes a mistake or 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 introduces a bug we have a donut rule where people have to bring the donuts and <laughs> so you have to you know confess your sins and everybody cheers because they get you know they get donuts so that's that's what's the fun place is just people are so so nice and supportive and helpful and available all the time it's been a fabulous place to work Gene, I'd like to say thank you for so many decades of support for STEM and all the young women at Expanding Your Horizons, all the things you've done for super kids and so on. It seems to have been a theme throughout and you've been such a great role model for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, th thanks so much for uh, a reminding of, a, the, of that, Becky. Yeah, that, that, that is phenomenal. And I see we're up on the, uh, the hour here, Gene. I, I've I certainly appreciate you taking the time to chat with it, you uh, chat with us and uh, and and learn more from you. And I, I could say I could spend a lot of time doing this, but 
uh, I think we'll have to bring it to a close. I do see, um, uh, let's see, Suni, uh, Sun Joy, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so some thank yous coming in. Thanks to all that attended and all that asked questions. And, and Osni, well, I guess we'll circle it back to you then. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Mark. I'll uh, just share my final slide here. Um, let's share my slide. Just thank you again. Thank you all for participating. Uh, feel free, please, to give us some feedback. Uh, we want to improve this series. Uh, and the next webinar in the series is going to be in, a in about a month, scientific software ecosystems and communities, why we need them and how each of us can help them thrive. Lois Kerfman mckinnis from Argonne National Laboratory will be talking. And uh, so that's the, I have pasted already this link in the chat so people can register. Thank you all again. Thank you. Bye-bye.